everyone, it's Eugene and welcome to another edition of Forensics Talks. This is going to be episode 86 and my guest today is Roberto King. Just before we begin here, I'm just going to say a few words here and that is first off, remember we have a comment section so make sure first off, tell us where you're from. Always like to know where people are watching from around the world, uh, what city, what country, whatever it might be. Uh, also, the questions and comments uh, as we get time or as I can, uh, you know, sort of browse over the questions. I'll see if I can pose any to Roberto today, uh, depending on the time that we have and such. So make sure you put your questions in there as well. And also something I haven't uh, really said much uh, in any of my videos and things like that is to subscribe to YouTube. I've had a couple of people people ask about, hey, uh, you know, how, how can I be informed when you're doing these talks and things like that? best way would be to just subscribe and then this way whenever i post something new or a new speaker or something you should get the notification right away so if you can just head over to the uh, 3d forensics channel and that will uh, get you going uh, a couple of things that are coming up uh, in the next few weeks and the first one is the recon 3d webinar that's the first thing that's coming up tomorrow so um, what's happening is there's a new release of recon 3d that's coming out and that release uh, we'll uh, have some new features and I'm going to be doing a webinar tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time and you can go through and I'll explain like what's going on, some of the changes and some of the new features I think that are going to be really interesting, especially now for some of the crime scene uh, people working in identification and stuff like that. So uh, the link is on the screen there. So by all means, uh, please go ahead and you can register for that. As I said, it's free. Also, it's going to be recorded, so it's going to be live streamed and it will remain on uh, either the Recon 3D website uh, or, or I should say YouTube channel or the uh, 3D Forensics uh, channel on YouTube. Also, there is a Cloud Compare course coming up, so on June 27 and 28. And if you are working with 3D point clouds, or if you're doing laser scanning, if you're doing photogrammetry, whatever it is that you're doing, Cloud Compare is a free program you can download, and it has a ton of features that allow you to edit, to do registration, to do animations, a whole bunch of different things. And so people that are doing the Recon 3D class, this is a wonderful complement to you know, the Recon 3D, especially if you're new to scanning and you don't have other you know, programs and stuff like that. So if you're interested, uh, go to the ai2-3d.com website and you'll see the training there. Just click on it and you'll be good to go. Finally, uh, there is another training class coming up and that's going to be, uh, I just announced it. So that's going to be also on the Recon 3D a website that's going to be the Recon 3D training class. So I don't know if I'm one of the only apps that has a training course uh, that goes with it, but um, there is a class that is available on July 11th, just announcing it, and you can go in, you can register for that. And of course, it's a certificate class. So uh, if you finish and you do the assignments and everything, you will get a certificate for it. Uh, it's also credited for ACTAR CEUs. So those of you uh, who are collision reconstruction people and you're also members of ACTAR, you can get some credit for that particular course. Okay. I think that's pretty much all I have to say there. Let me see. Yeah, I think that's good. So I'm going to get started here. Let me clean this up and let's get to our guest. So Dr. Roberto King, he's the vice president of product at Foster and Freeman in the UK, overseeing the company's product innovation and development portfolio. Previously, he was the chief technology officer, and that's where I first met him. Um, Roberto gained a first-class honors degree in chemistry and sports science from Lobro University in 2005, and he completed his PhD in chemistry four years later at the same institution. He's a versatile inorganic chemist with experience in the application of chemistry within the forensic arena, and his background involves the development of novel fingerprint enhancing agents for use on troublesome substrates, as well as investigation into unique methodologies for evidence recovery from document-based evidence. His current research interests involve finger marks, body fluids, question document examination, trace evidence, and contact transfer. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about some of these topics for sure. 
And he's published a whole bunch of papers, more than 25 research papers, uh, three book chapters, and he's appeared on numerous television broadcasts. He's lectured um, and he's been even a presenter at the Forensic Photography Symposium that I held in January. And he did a, a talk on visualizing blood. And I remember it was actually quite a technical talk and really great information um, for those of you that were there. Now, we've had some past discussions on 3D document analysis, um, both Roberto and I and some of his team, and I really think it's a, an interesting area. And so when I saw recently that a paper came out, um, I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about some of the work that he was doing and maybe where he's going in this area. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring Roberto in. There he is. Hi, there, Roberto. Hey. Hey, Eugene. Good, thanks. Thanks right. for having me. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here, and uh, and thank you again for talking at the forensic photography symposium. Way yeah, back. it seems like it seems like a long time ago, actually, but it, it wasn't really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, time flies when you're having fun. Um, well, I, I usually start guests on their background because I'm often curious about how people got to where they were. Um, so, uh, if I if we wind the clock back before Roberto was in university and he was trying to figure out what he was trying to do, yeah. were, were you one of those techie kids or were you? Uh, those, no, 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 not at all. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. My uh, my my primary focus when I was kind of um, going through sort of the the last years of school here was was sport. I was kind of mad on sport. Anything uh, that would involve getting out and and being competitive that was kind of where my where my interest lay. Um, and I I was kind of I, I was naturally kind of um, I guess interested in science, but but more so from a from an application perspective rather than understanding the theory behind it all. And um, the in in the UK, um, Loughborough University is um, you know known for being you know world leading um, for as a sports institution, and, and and you know they excel in 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 various aspects of science and and engineering and, and IT, but sports science is really where um, where they're kind of known uh, across the world. And so for me, it was I wanted to do sports science, and I wanted to do it at Loughborough University. Um, that kind of developed a little bit into me taking on a joint honors program and um, with with chemistry as kind of the, you know the, the other discipline uh, I won't bore you with the details as to how that how that came about but but it did and, and my um, my my kind of my primary uh, kind of ambition was to get into in, into the university start studying both and then if I wanted to make the transfer directly to sports science then I would have done so but I wanted to keep my options open um, and then I kind of got into the the after the first semester and first first semester of uh, university is always difficult, right? There's, there's a, it's a steep learning curve. You're into the big wide world, right? And um, I ended up really enjoying the 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 chemistry that I was being taught. And I think for me, the uh, the fundamental difference between learning chemistry or science at school and learning at university was the way that it was being taught to me. Um, and I learned a lot during those few years and it's something that i like still to this day i'm really passionate about in terms of outreach engagement promoting science getting people interested at a young age um it's something that i do sort of regularly um i guess well as regularly as possible go to sort of local schools outreach mm -hmm. events and, and try and just just talk a little bit about the fundamentals of science and, and how they all apply but anyway digress a little bit but um but yeah i i kind of had a bit of a I developed a bit of a spark for chemistry and I turned out to be relatively good at it, I guess. Um, and I enjoyed the practical side of things and got to the end of the three years. Uh, I did the joint honours and I did did pretty good in, in my degree. And there was an opportunity for a, for a PhD studentship. And of course, I was kind of like many in my situation, um, you know, come to graduation year. What am I going to do? I don't really know what I want to do. Um, but everyone around me was saying the more... Um, the more qualifications you can get, the better. It stands you in better stead. So PhD opportunity came around. Inorganic chemistry, okay. I'm, you know, I'm, I enjoy in, inorganic chemistry. Let, let's have a go at that. So I then started a, a PhD in inorganic chemistry. And my, my remit for that PhD was actually to um, explore some um, applications of um, some main group chemistry. And it had nothing to do with forensic science at all. And um, we were sort of working on a project, actually looking at um, developing a material that could um, detect ammonia. 
Um, and one of the interesting properties with this particular material was that it was actually a superconductor at low temperature. And it formed these really quite intricate um, molecular wires um, of two molecules, sulfur and nitrogen. And our idea after the sort of ammonia sensor project didn't really work out was to, well, what about if we can look at incorporating these molecular wires into something inert and you're effectively, you're creating these insulated molecular wires. And the idea with that or the application drive at the time was kind of miniaturization of electronic devices, right? Um, and so we started doing that and we had some, some really good success, but this is where I fell into forensics pretty much by accident was the, the material that we were using, um, is deployed as a, as a, as a vapor gas under, under a vacuum atmosphere. And, um, we were finding that we were developing fingerprints on all of our glassware that we've been using. And, uh, it was actually, um, in the first few instances, it was more of an annoyance because we couldn't actually see inside the, inside the reaction vessel. Um, but we ended up, um, we ended up kind of just digging into the literature because, you know, this was about 2006 and 2006, we, we were there kind of thinking, well, um, surely no one's interested in fingerprint processes like fingerprints have been used for hundreds of years. Right. And, uh, why would there be an interest? But there was more and more being published. And I remember seeing quite an intricate paper, um, that was talking about SEM analysis of developed finger marks. And it was in quite a high profile journal and thought, actually, there's, there's maybe more to this. And it was then really didn't really have much of an experience in forensic science. It wasn't the CSI, Miami, CSI, Vegas um, thing that it is now. Um, it was, you know, it was sort of it was it was kind of just coming into the sort of TV um, realms. And uh, and so. It was a steep learning curve. We, we engage with um, people at the UK Home Office, pe people in the sort of um, UK Defence Laboratory. Um, and we, we realised that we had something actually that could potentially be quite powerful. And so the next however many years to where we are now, kind of my journey developed from researching um, what was fundamental chemistry to applying that, I guess, um, coincidental observation to a forensic challenge and that then moved on to me kind of getting a real passion for that and wanting to make a difference and I think that that's key it's yes I'm, I'm, I'm really keen on engaging and promoting and talking about all things kind of science or forensic science but I'm also keen on what we do in terms of our research and and and, and now at Foster and Freeman product development um, and making a difference in the real world and I think that's that's why I ultimately moved from the academic environment where I was absolutely enjoying um, researching and developing research and working and, and developing people that were working in my research team as I, as I grew through um, uh, through the ranks a little bit. Um, but I wanted to see that transition. And that's often where a lot of these kind of great ideas kind of fall over is that is that kind of valley of death between great mm -hmm. idea, we can prove the concept, but what about actually productizing it and getting it used in anger so so yeah that in a nutshell that's a, a little bit about <laughs> my, my background yeah i think uh well one thing that strikes me about you and, and i'm the same way is that you're not a one-trick pony and that you have a diverse interests in many different areas and i think i think that's always helpful when a person is a a generalist uh not a, and i shouldn't say that but you're actually specialized in many areas but you, know, you borrow from one place and and you bring yeah something yeah that's right together. I mean, I, I would say, you know, my, my, my passion really where my heart is, is in fingerprints. Um, I think that largely because that's where it all started, but there is so much with forensics where you, you're absolutely right. You borrow from one discipline that might be on the fringes of what we would call forensic science. Um, and you, you adapt it and you, you see opportunity. Uh, and it's difficult sometimes to see, to see how potentially something quite abstract can be um, kind of molded and formed to have real world application um, in the discipline that we work in. So um, yeah, it's it, every day is is different and um, there are different challenges, whether it be fingerprints, whether it be question documents, whether it be crime scene. Um, and you know, I guess the the the, the state of the uh, the forensic landscape is changing a lot. Um, it has started to change and it certainly will accelerate at pace with the introduction of cyber uh, cyber terrorism cyber threat digital forensics these are areas that are exploding at pace now and um 
you know, there are, you know, that's outside of my immediate comfort zone, but it's certainly something I've got an interest in. So again, keen to see how, how, how maybe there are some synergies there. Yeah. So we, your introduction to Foster and Freeman though, was that while you were in school or, or was it right after you graduated? Um, no, I, I mean, I was aware of Foster and Freeman whilst I was um, doing my PhD. Um, we actually worked with them uh, to some degree in looking at trying to productize the technique that we were working on. But it, it was one of those situations where the, um, the, the, the process was, was being used operationally um, by UK Ministry of Defence. And so it was something that needed to actually, at that moment in time, not develop any further beyond their operational capacity. Um, and so, but but that was my introduction to Foster and Freeman, and then it kind of came back around full circle. We ended up developing the product a, f a few years ago now, uh, in, and that's the Recover product that um, that we, we spoke briefly about before we came on on air. Um, but but yeah, I mean that that was my introduction to Foster and Freeman, and um, I think once you once you start digging into the physical forensic sciences and forensic technology and forensic technology manufacturers and suppliers, then. Foster and Freeman are one of those companies, one of those organizations that have presence. Um, and for me, it was the natural kind of progression uh, in my career anyway, and it was at the right time to do so. So what position did you begin with in Foster Freeman? What was your initial um, so, role? So I started as a, an R&D application specialist, a research and development application specialist. And um, it's quite funny because I remember having um, some some early discussions when I when I when I started at Foster and Freeman. Again, big step into the big wide world. You're not in the academic bubble anymore. You're in the sort of um, I guess the the commercial, the industrial um, bubble. And um, you know it was what you know what what was my remit at that time? Well, actually, we were quite a, we were a relatively small organisation when I joined. I think there were about eighty something people in the business. Um, just to put that into perspective, we're about 160 now. I've uh, been there nine years, so we, we've developed pretty, pretty well. Um, and there wasn't, we had a couple of chemists, we had a, a couple of physicists. Um, everything that we do at Foster and Freeman is, is, was and is done in-house. We don't outsource stuff. We have our own research and development department, and that's where I was embedded within. And we had access to uh, a, a chemistry lab. Um, and that basically became my kind of lair, my little chamber. And I just tinkered in there and I was working on fingerprint stuff. And interestingly, at the time, uh, as, I, as I mentioned a, a few moments ago, um, always it's always important to keep an eye on the landscape and, and understand what challenges are, are, are coming down the track. At the time for in the UK, we were we were due to be moving over to polymer currency, which I know in Canada, you guys have, have had polymer currency for a number of years. And one of the biggest challenges that we had or the UK police forces had, the forensic force teams had, was how do we develop fingerprints on, on this new currency? Um, because we've, we've kind of honed our processes for the paper-based materials that we've had for years. And uh, now we're having this polymer currency. What do we do? Well, yes, you can look to the likes of Canada and Australia, who are, I guess, they were world leaders in putting that technology in place, putting polymer currency in circulation, but also developing the um, the infrastructure behind it, for, not only from the bank manufacturers and all of their technology, their ATMs, but but also the policing processes and, and, and looking at that. But the difference in the UK uh, scenario was that we were using an entirely different type of polymer material. So the base material was completely different, which meant that the coatings and the inks and the pigments and everything else was all entirely new. So it was a really steep learning curve. So for me, that I saw that as a really good opportunity to say, well, okay, we've got something that's coming in the next year or so. Um, we know that we need to have a better understanding of what fingerprint processes we can use. There was question document stuff as well that we also got involved with, where, you know, what are the optical properties of these things? But actually, what are the challenges there with, with developing fingerprints on banknotes, but also on polymer banknotes. And we then developed actually a, a range of two uh, independent uh, fingerprint powders that have unique properties where they, they fluoresce in the infrared part of the spectrum. And the benefit there is that you don't have any background interference. And that's one of the biggest challenges that you have when trying to get good ridge detail from 
currency that has these really intricate patterns in the background. You have fluorescent security features. Um, so that was something that I got my teeth into straight away. Um, and uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I got to work quite closely with uh, with the Bank of England and got access to to some of these notes before they even went into circulation. So that was really cool, you know, coming mm -hmm. out of the academic environment straight into that. Um, but yeah, I was an R&D application specialist and I was working on pretty much any kind of bits of research that needed to be done to help support or bring a product through from, it might have been blue sky kind of concepts, or it might have just been evolutionary um, productization, but, but uh, they were the kind of projects that I was working on. Well, see, I mean, you were CTO and then you moved into yeah. your current role, which is, was yeah. product. So, um, which, which I can see a lot of relationship, like there's some close yeah. overlap there. So as, as your current role right now, how deep are you able to get into each of the different products? I mean, is, is it more like sort of driving it from a high level or like yeah. how deep do you get? It's, it's, it's one of those where you'd love to be able to be really, really close to absolutely everything. Um, but it, as always, it's, it's having the bandwidth to do that. Um, I think so. So for me, um, I kind of sit above that and try and, and try and drive it in the right direction. But that, that, that requires kind of having understanding of, um, our existing product roadmap, our product portfolio, understanding what um, emerging technologies in other areas may enable us to do certain things within our sphere. Um, it enables us to get really close and have really good relationships with end users um, to understand what their challenges are. It requires us to understand regulatory changes that might be happening in certain jurisdictions. So, you know, the introduction of things like ISO 17025 or 17020, that means that we need to change the way that we develop product because there's going to be a need by, from the end users to, um, to be able to do things in a, a much more controlled manner and a reliable and repeatable manner. Um, but it also involves us um, keeping an eye on the research that's going on and seeing what other people are doing because quite often the trends in certain, uh, certain sectors can help you understand where some of the challenges are because quite often the research that's being done is being funded and the reason the funding is there is because there's a challenge that needs to be solved so i i i try and stay as close as possible to things i mean generally speaking we will develop as a as a, as a company we'll probably launch a couple of products a year um the pandemic was a really interesting time not obviously for everyone um but for us we kind of we were, when, when we develop products, we're not necessarily just developing one product and then we move on to another. We're, we're sort of co-developing co and they'll be at different stages. Now, when the pandemic came through, we, were, we had about three or four projects on the, on the sort of, on the agenda. And our, our focus really during that pandemic was to get those finished. We, so, and so we launched three or four products in, in a relatively short space of time. But generally speaking, we, we'll try and launch one to two products a year. So that means that can be a lot closer to them, can kind of support them in, in um, a bit more of a, uh, an intimate way, if you will, uh, and, and then work with ensuring, because the job isn't just about get, having the ideas, developing the products, launching it, and then starting the next. It's also about support. It's, in, in some respects, it's more important to support that introduction into the marketplace. Um, and so really my, my transition from CTO where I was overseeing all of the research and understanding the way that that research could funnel into new product development. Um, the, in some respects that the work that you do today, you see the benefits of that three, four, five years down the line. Moving into the role I'm in at the minute, it's trying to disseminate that knowledge the power of some of the new technologies um with the end users and the end user is uh, isn't always the person that's using the product it's sometimes the people that are in the procurement agencies that need to understand what the business case is for a particular technology if it's going to save me time is it going to give me um you know higher reproducibility is it going to be more reliable all those kind of things so it's trying to it's trying to work as closely as possible and have this kind of customer centric approach to to everything that we do and uh, uh, you know that's really important and being connected on 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 teams on zoom all these kind of things that the pandemic brought with it um has enabled us to to have these conversations and have these dialogues a lot more readily. 
Yeah, the transfer of information during that time has been incredible. And I, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, the I, just before the pandemic, I was sort of already transitioning into doing online training and such. So when it hit, it was incredible. Like the response, yeah. I think June of 2020, you could have had a course on basket weaving. Everyone was was on board. People were buying online courses. It was budget for training and everything else. So uh, I, I think I said to you yesterday when when when, when the we sort of went into lockdown, um, we ended up we were the first kind of organization within our particular market sector to try our hands at webinars and it was actually something that we'd wanted to do for a number of years but it was kind of oh, i'm not sure that will really take on and maybe it will maybe it won't but then we were forced into it because at the end of the day you know when you when you are an organization that ultimately relies on selling product right then you have to find ways to get out there and and engage and so we we decided to to do to do our first webinar in June 2020, and I, uh, and I remember it so clearly. I remember being in our demo room, and we had two webcams, and we tried to do live presentation, live demo with scientific equipment. You know, it's never going to go quite <laughs> as you wish. Um, yeah. And we, I, I remember doing it, and we had you know we had about 90 people on, and I was amazed. You know, that's 90 people that we had. Uh, yeah, a captive audience with for an hour and um, yeah okay people may have tried to dial into the basket weaving course and got us accidentally but but you know it was it was great to actually have that dialogue with people and it's something that we've we've stuck with and and now if anyone's dialed into any of our webinars they're much more polished um and we have a live q a section at the end which is which personally is always the best bit for me because it's great to feel that feedback and hear what some of the questions and and try and sort of answer them as best as possible. We don't always have the answers, right? But we, we certainly try to find them out if we don't if we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. The interaction is is uh, is a great part when you can sort of you know when it's not just one way and and you can get feedback, which is great. Um, I want to knock off a couple of things off of the list here, and because you have there's four areas here when I go under products, and they were actually it was a good way to sort of approach this. So I want to circle back to question documents after the other three. And so can you give me just a couple minutes on what you guys are doing right now with trace evidence analysis. I see a, you know, a number, you know, RAM Spectra, you got Forum, you got some other things there. So um, just maybe give me a summary of, of what you guys are doing in there. And then we'll go on to fingerprints, forensic light sources, and yeah. we'll, we'll knock off question documents. Yeah, so, so trace evidence is um, kind of um, a, one aspect of what we do. There are four main value streams that you've got up on the screen there. Um, within the sort of trace evidence um, product line, we have systems that allow us to do uh, analysis of things like fibers glass fragments so you may have heard of a technique called uh, glass ref glass refractive index measurement or grim that's a technique that was developed by by foster and freeman it allows you to uh, look at the refractive index of glass match a particular fragment of glass to another source elsewhere so we have within our trace evidence product portfolio we have um, a, a grim set up we do raman spectroscopy as well um, so we have um, a few different offerings on, on laboratory benchtop raman uh, spectrometers what different uses and applications we get involved from a question document side of things we know that they use for the analysis of inks toners um, um, different things di different things that may be on, on printed um, surfaces but they can also be used for for looking at things like minerals and um, and soils and uh, and whatnot uh, and then we have an FFTA, which is our kind of, our, I guess, our flagship trace evidence um, system, which allows you to do pretty much anything that you would need to do that uses a microscope. So microspectrophotometry, um, as I said, the glass refractive index measurements, um, you can do polarization microscopy. Um, so, you know, it's, it's for the, the more advanced, I guess, the more advanced laboratory that requires to have that higher level of interrogation down to the sort of, um, microscopic size. Um, on the fingerprint side, um, you've got imaging systems, you got fuming systems, and you said, you know, you have some novel techniques, I think yeah. with powders and stuff. So yeah. can you give me a summary, uh, give me a summary of what you're doing? Well, yeah, right now? I mean, our fingerprint technology technologies really break into two main areas. One is finger mark enhancement. So that would be let, we've got to develop the fingerprints. Um, and so one of the products that we're um, sort of synonymous with is, is cyanide acrylate fuming, which is sort of evaporating super glue. Um, 
and that's probably one of the most longest standing techniques for, for fingerprint enhancement. So we develop cabinets for that. Um, we also have some novel techniques, like you mentioned when I spoke about recover, but we've also got the infrared fingerprint powders. And then once you've developed these fingerprints, well, you need to image them. And fingerprint imaging is an art in its, in its own right. Um, it's great if you've got a black finger mark on a white piece of paper, but when you haven't, it gets a little bit more, a little bit more interesting. So we have imaging workstations from more automated, simple to use to much, much more advanced um, kind of pro grade SLR camera driven systems as well. Okay. On the light source side, I mean, you have a bunch of stuff there. And I know that when you did the presentation, you talked a lot about, mm. you know, infrared and things that fluoresce and all kinds of stuff like that. So, and I see the crime light, there's a whole bunch of things. So, um, yeah, give me, give me a quick, quick summary. We, of the front Yeah. So, so Foster and Freeman, I guess, and, and crime light are two words that you often hear. They, they go hand in hand. We, we were the first company that introduced an led based forensic light source. Before that, people were using things like xenon arc lamps, halogen lights, they were filtering the light. The problem you have with that, of course, is that the intensity in, uh, output at day one is different to intensity at day two, day three, day four. Um, you, don't, you don't have the ability to finally filter the light in the same way that you do an LED. So when the LEDs came onto the market in the late 90s, um, it was something that we thought, you know, there's actually some application here. And so we, we actually, Took, took that on and uh, we developed the crime light and that's kind of gone on from single LEDs to really, really intense 16 LED, really high output intensity, handheld light sources. We developed a, a laser product that we launched uh, a year ago as well. Uh, so taking something that would be the size of a small suitcase, uh, which would be, your, you know, your archetypical lasers to something that is handheld, really portable, untethered, battery powered to the crime scene. Um, and and then I guess that's really culminated in the Crime Light Auto, which is taking all of our Crime Light technology and know-how and all of our imaging expertise and putting it all together and having a handheld system that you can take out to a crime scene, use a range of multi-spectral imaging across the, across the spectrum, UV, visible, infrared, capture the image, send it onto an app and then send it straight, straight back to the laboratory. So, you know, times have changed. The, the 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 practitioner needs have changed, and um, the requirements to do things methodically, record things as you go, is driven the evolution of that particular technology. So, yeah, yeah, that's been a, a really interesting journey over the last ten years, I'd say. Now, with all these products, and even with the the question um, document examination area, are you doing? Uh, is it pretty much products, or are you doing services as well? Um, in terms of, um, for example, of, yeah, case somebody's case. got a difficult, yeah, like a case. Yeah, no, no, we, we, we generally don't, I say generally, we, we don't do anything like that in house. We have supported in, in instances where, um, a particular technology might be required for a, a particular case. There was a, a, a cold case actually in, in the U S where, um, we used the recover technology on an item of evidence that was from that that was a 38 year old cold case um, and we developed the mark that actually identified the individual um, and that was you know that was an instance where it was well we haven't got anything else we've tried everything we've heard about this technology can we give it a go uh, and and so we did and, and it's good to work really closely with um with with forces you know on, on the front line to to give them some um some product where they need it, when they need it, and, and try and support it in that way. Okay. Um, so on the question documents, again, there's three areas here. And under the laboratory systems, actually, I'll bring it up here. Let's let's talk about the ESDA2. That's that's one product. And there's an interesting case here. Can you can you talk about the case that you, where you use yeah, this so, particular instrument? So, so the ESDA, or the ESDA, ESDA, stands for Electrostatic Detection Apparatus. And that is uh, pretty much the, the product that started Foster and Freeman um, back in the late 70s. So... The company was officially formed in 1978 and um, an interesting background because this, this product is synonymous with question document examination. Um, every question document lab laboratory will have an ESDA in there. Um, the process uh, it, as it's used um, today is, is primarily for developing indented writing on paper. So when, you, when you're writing with a pen, um, obviously several sheets below that you can't see any visible uh, indentations 
for the most part. The ESDA has the ability to reveal those indentations. Now, when that product, when the research was going into this particular product in the in the 70s by the company owners, Doug Foster and Bob Freeman, they were, um, they were working on a project for the uh, London College of Printing. And their, um, their project scope was to develop a non-contact technique for developing fingerprints on fabrics. And they came up with this electrostatic approach and it didn't really work for developing fingerprints on fabrics it does work at developing fresh fingerprints on on some surfaces but for the most part it kind of failed in what it set out to do but what they did find again one of these kind of serendipitous observations was that they were able to develop these indentations and uh, they then worked quite closely with the uk police and and as you've got on the screen there the very first case um, in, in the late 70s was there was a, a, a bank robbery in London and the, there was a note that was handed over to the, to the bank teller and the police ended up taking that note and using this ESDA process, which wasn't a, it wasn't a technology at the time, it wasn't something that had been launched, sorry, um, and they actually developed some indentations that was, that was basically a, a letter to somebody in Canada asking them, pleading with them to send money to an address in Surrey in the UK. The police then went to that address and found the person that had committed um, this, this particular uh, robbery. So that was the, the moment whereby Doug Foster and Bob Freeman realized they had something pretty powerful and they, they developed the ESDA. They started building it from their, from their shed, from the, from the garage um, in the hometown uh, in London. And, um, and, and the company really sort of formed off the back of that. So question document examination really started Foster and Freeman. It's at the very heart of what we do. Um, but as you say, the way that forensics work is you, you know, you borrow technologies from certain areas to apply them in others. And we've branched out as a function of that to those four value streams that you mentioned. Okay. So what, what did the v, these VSC um, instruments do for you? Um, okay, so the VSC has a, a video spectral comparator, um, and there, there are a range of VSCs from the, 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 the more entry level or the, 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 the more basic in terms of functionality to what you've got on the screen now on the left hand side, the v, VSC 8000 HS, that's our sort of flagship VSC system. Um, they allow the, the, the examiner, whether it be on the front line, whether it be a secondary or tertiary examination in the sort of back offices or in a QDE laboratory, to analyze um, suspect documents, identity cards, um, yeah, anything that you can fit in that sort of, uh, yeah, inside the actual unit. Um, we can examine it with a range of light sources, um, a range of different um, imaging techniques and, uh, and technologies. And it allows you to um, confirm authenticity, to look for any um, fraudulent activity, any um, kind of obliterations, anything suspect that may have happened to a document um, is, is what the VSC is really designed to do. Um, you know, you have uh, bank um, banks use them for authenticating and, and looking at security features in in banknotes, for example, um, but it's a really powerful tool that just allows you to uh, to take a, a piece of evidence, generally something that's flat, um, and interrogate it optically and and kind of learn from it. And it's a it's a video spectral comparator. The idea being that it you compare it to a known a known standard or or, or something that that you believe to be um, believe to be true. Okay, great. So with the with different wavelengths, you, you may be able to separate one type of ink sure. versus another yeah, so, or something. So a classic example is a, is, a, is a check that's been written. We don't really do checks anymore, right? But a <laughs> um, check that's been written for a certain amount, and then someone's added an extra zero on the end of it. Well, with the VSC, quite often, whilst the inks visibly may look the same, blue ink, black ink, red ink, whatever, um, when you illuminate them at different parts of the spectrum, there are some very fine differences that you can often see. Uh, in terms of their fluorescence, in terms of their absorption or their reflection. And the VSC allows you to differentiate those and to sort of say, okay, there has something's gone on here. Um, similar sort of um, example is uh, deeds of a house or a will. If pages have been inserted, there are things that you can look, look for in terms of the typeset or in, or in terms of 
um, the spacing, uh, you know, different fluorescent properties of the actual um, of the inks or of the actual paper itself. And, and that's what, where the VSEs really come into their own. And we have a range of them because we appreciate the fact that if you're, for example, immigration and you're sort of frontline border inspection, you need a different set of tools in a, in a small footprint than you might have when you're kind of back in the laboratory where you need as much as you, as you can possibly have uh, right. at your disposal. Um, let's, a while back, we had, we had a discussion about, you know, using 3D technologies for like question documents and stuff like that. And so I'm curious about how, uh, you know, what first prompted your interest in that particular area, because I, I know there are some papers out there and I, I've had some other guests talking about question documents and there's just been a little bit of work in that area, but it seems relatively new that there's still, still a lot of work to be done in that particular field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, historically um, we have we we have developed um, ways to a allow the end user to observe and, and interrogate three dimensional features. Now, you know, when we look at when we look at images, um, forensic images, there we we see a two dimensional representation of something. But we live in a three dimensional world, and so you know, it's it's true to say that when you interrogate things on the z-axis there's probably more another layer of information another dimension of information um, that's there to be had and what we've tried to do as vsc technology has evolved is um, develop complementary lighting that has allowed us to get the best out of that three-dimensional profile now you know we all know that there are tactile features on identity cards and passports and stuff we can feel them we need to be able to image them, and that's quite difficult sometimes. You know, you you rely on when you've got a camera above something, um, you rely on effectively illuminating it in a way that gives you low light, low lights, and highlights, and and everything in between. Um, and we we developed the technology to a point where we were able to do that pretty well. Side lighting is really effective, capture illumination, all these kind of um, uh, tools and tricks. But more recently, we introduced a, pr a process called photometric stereo. And photometric stereo is effectively, in, in its simplest terms, where you illuminate from different angles all the way around a particular um, subject. So you have the subject in the middle and you illuminate all the way around. And you can do that at different parts of the spectrum. But what that does is it creates, uh, yeah, in that instance there, so the limited sign, um, you can see that the, the image in the middle there is... Um, each one of those is a snapshot from an illumination at a different angle. And when you build that composite image, you can get all of that detail come together uh, to the image on the right. So that's where we had got up to with the um, 3D imaging within uh, the VSCs. And it was a really, really powerful um, tool. And when we launched it only a couple of years back, um, people were seeing some really impressive results from it. But I guess the question then is, well, what's the, where's the application? Like, how, how do we, how do we relate what we're seeing? Yes, it's nice to have these great images. How do we relate that to a particular forensic challenge? And um, and that's really what this paper tried to address a little bit more because we had um, we had within our within our own sort of research and development team done quite a lot of applications um, exercises looking at the power of photometric stereo, and we were we were aware that actually one of the longest standing challenges for question document examination uh, examiners is intersecting lines. So where you have two pen strokes to understand the sequence of those lines is really, really quite difficult. And there are instrumental techniques that are highly sophisticated using seriously expensive equipment that can, to some extent, give you some degree of objectivity. Um, but, it's not in the platform or the or the kind of entity that question document examiners are used to using. Um, and so we wanted to try and delve a little bit deeper into the application of photometric stereo because we had seen that we could see some pretty significant differences that allowed us to say, you know, in a, in a let's say, a blind study, you could quite easily discern which that was the first stroke and which was the second. And so what we tried to do with this particular piece of work was say, okay, well, we know photometric stereo has it has some some benefits to um, to forensic science in terms of the analysis question documents. There are other applications as well, but actually, let's try and 
put that into some sort of context in terms of the applications that you might have and where it can come in useful. And then building on from that, this particular paper then took things a little bit further in, in terms of another type of imaging, which is elastomeric sensor imaging, which was um, kind of a, a completely abstract app utilization of a piece of technology, which I'd happened to have seen whilst I think trawling LinkedIn actually. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen that there was this technology, this elastomeric sensor imaging that was being used for the analysis of surface defects on different metals. So during the manufacturing process, wanting to ensure that you had a particular grain pattern or, or what have you. And the resolution and the sensitivity seemed to be really high. But one of the things that interested me and the guys that we were working with on this project was that you were able to use that particular modality to give you a degree of quantification. Now, photometric stereo is very good at seeing these differences and presenting them as what you've got on the screen, which is like a bump map where you can mm -hmm. see the 3D relief pattern. Um, but it's it's harder to discern depth. And what, our, what we were trying to um, establish with this paper was, uh, is what we're seeing with photometric stereo where you can clearly see that there are differences in pressure points and depths, is that directly related, as we suspected, to quantifiable measurements and we our plan was to use the elastomeric sensor imaging or the, uh, on the gel site product to kind of co complete that that kind of hypothesis if you will um and so we used the two the two different technologies in in a complementary manner to kind of prove that actually yes that is that is the case and uh, it, was a, it was a really interesting piece of work you know obviously couldn't have done it without without the co-authors who to some extent have a a lot more um, experience in, in question document and uh, and the analysis of this kind of data that, than I do. But it, it was good to kind of take something that you kind of think, well, actually, that's that's got a really interesting application for the automotive industry. But I can really see some benefits for forensic science. And let's have a little bit of a, a look at it. Yeah, uh, photometric stereo, I, I and I knew this from a, a while ago in some research, is that it's really good for very fine details, but it's often prone to distortions over larger areas. Um, so I, it's, that's why people don't use it for like very big models or whatever. It just has to be a very small area. So, And I noticed in your paper, you did mention that uh, what you call like low frequency uh, distortions and things like that. But gel site, I had known about um, from Cadre Forensics. They use it for uh, ballistics or for, yes. you know, cartridge cases and things. And so it's an interesting technology, but it is a contact technology. So, um, although yeah, I, I think, I think yeah. that's one of the, what was one of the things that, um, you know, with any piece of research that you present, it's, 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 it's important to kind of discuss it from all angles and talk about the strengths, weaknesses, limitations, applications. And I think one of the things that, we we did kind of conclude with with that particular technique in its current form and there are some thoughts about how it could be exploited in a different way um was that because you were making contact with the um the particular sample um we we did have questions as to how from a, a repeatability perspective if you did 10 scans would it look the same on the 10th as it does on the first because you're naturally depressing the the particular sample so i think it will really depend on what you're looking at um but if it um but we also saw in some instances where we were looking at um, specific inks we were seeing that we were getting some transfer onto the bottom of the gel pad that's mm -hmm. on, the, on the bottom okay. of that device so we had to uh, we, so we have obviously had to clean it off and so so there are obviously where you can be non-contact is 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 better so um, how much pressure are you actually putting on the, the the device or the gel um so we, we it was a bit of a trial and error uh, kind of approach and we we ended up um kind of doing it almost to, to feel um there's there comes a point where certainly with the samples that we were looking at you can press harder and harder but you don't see any 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 further changes to the to the values that were coming out and that was kind of our our set point i believe that that the the, the application that cadre forensics are using for their um ballistics examination they apply a fixed pressure which is yeah, absolutely the the right way to go about it because um then you can sure be sure that you've got that reliability and that repeatability the problem of course is it's a contact process so you're going to have contact transfer 
um, you know, and you know, then you get into the realms of well, cross contamination, DNA, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sure, so, sure. Um, is the is the gel? Uh, I'll just call it a gel pad. I'm not sure what it's yeah. properly termed, but is it something that is you know good for you know hundreds of scans or hundreds of? Yeah, uh, it depends. Um, it depends on the um, on on the particular application and the pressure that's being used. They have a high sensitivity and a low sensitivity gel so it's a, uh, i guess a different chemical composition but you're right it is a gel pad and it's got a uh like a silver silver coating on one side um and it's good for yeah hundreds into the thousands of applications depending on what you're what you're doing with it um okay. but it can be cleaned down in between runs and they're relatively cheap i think to to replace the consumable um, side of things okay so so let me ask you so you've got the photometric stereo you've got uh, the gel site system, the, the elastomer, um, you know, this gel pad or whatever. So wh what was the test that you performed with each of these and what did each of the, the results show? So what you've, what you've got on the screen there um, was, was our starting point. We were, we, if you just maybe scroll, scroll up a little. Yeah. We, um, we, we had a, a donor um, basically write their signature. I think we did it sort of eight times. Um, but two of those instances, we asked them to do the signature in reverse. Um, and we did that at different points across that. We didn't just do that because we wanted to interrupt the, the, the kind of regularity of the process. Um, and quite obviously, just from looking at these, you can see which two have been done as the unnatural um, method. But that wasn't the point of this work it wasn't you know a, a, an experienced question document examiner would easily be able to say well that one there is, is is a is a is not an authentic signature but what we were trying to show was where when you're when you're kind of doing things in a certain reliable uh, repeatable manner you you get certain grooves and different formations on the paper when that changes then that so do so does the three-dimensional effects that you're imparting on, on the actual surface. Um, and so we we got um, one of the guys to, to do this signature. We then analyzed it, as you can see here, this is with photometric stereo. And you can clearly see that. And what we were looking for was the changes at the intersections or changes where there's a, a, um, uh, a discontinuation of the, of the flow of the stroke. So where you're going up and then straight down, um, we, were, we were interested in those particular areas. Um, and what we, what we found was, as we suspected that we were getting complete differences at the intersections where the where the lines crossed, and we were getting a, a difference in the where the actual um, the depth profile was was being carved out into the paper, or where the stroke where the signature was being done in reverse. Interesting. And the so that, that was the photometric stereo, and then uh, so we have the images there, and then um, we then took those intersections and we looked at them with the gel site so that we could understand quantifiably the difference in the depth profile. So there you can see the gel site images of those particular areas. Um, and below each of those is an actual, uh, it's effectively a surface profile. Um, and you can, you can quite clearly see the jump where the, the paper goes into the pen. Um, and and we, we were able to kind of, I guess, substantiate our photometric stereo findings with the, the elastomeric sensor imaging um, findings as well. Is so that was it? That was the starter starting point of the work, and then we did some other work looking at um, um, the sequence of pen ink um, with toner that was printed on. So, can you tell whether it's quite hard optically sometimes to to discern whether a pen stroke is above or below uh, an area of toner? Um, and so this this example here, we were able to differentiate the two because we could see the difference in depth profile between when the toner was applied on top of the pen stroke or when the toner was applied below the pen stroke. It gave you a completely different profile. Now, the again, we're talking about the profile. You, you look at that cross section when you cut across it or whatever. And I think that's really mm -hmm. an important part is you can quantify it now because you can say, hey, look, if we compare, you know, five samples uh, together, you know, we get this repeatable sort of. Uh, you yeah. know, within some some tolerance uh, of this these these profiles, and so that doesn't seem like something that has really been presented that way before, or has it? Maybe I'm wrong. 
Uh, no, um, uh, people have people have. It's been looked at, um, but but certainly um, in terms of what we were trying to do here was actually have something which is relatively accessible. Um, we did some work with the University of Kent um, a couple of years back, and we were we doing a similar bit of work really, where we were looking at three dimensional imaging of question documents, but we were using a a technique called optical coherence tomography or OCT. Now that's typically, you'll see that uh, at the optometrist when you go and have a, a, scan of, a scan of the retina because it's generally used for uh, imaging biological tissue and getting um, getting layers through, um, through um, biological tissue and building up a 3D um, profile of what that looks like. And we wondered whether we could use OCT to interrogate question documents in the third dimension and we actually published a piece of work looking at um, polycarbonates and the, the on identity cards you get layers of polycarbonates and we were able to show the way that um, security fibers are embedded within that particular in, in the polycarbonate layer so whereas when you just have a two-dimensional image you would just see the fiber appearing we were now able to show where it actually appears in the third dimension as well so people have looked into other ways of, of getting three-dimensional um, information from question documents. But I would say that this is probably the first bit of work that's really allowed it to be accessible, quantifiable, and actually put into context with optical measurements meeting up with quantifiable uh, measurements on, on, on the other side as well. Yeah, I know working in other areas, for example, uh, we have uh, a project going on where we have uh, some interns looking at footwear impressions, like in, in yes. yeah, in, in sand or whatever. And so the documentation part is usually the easy part. So you can scan it in different methods and use whatever. But then the analysis part is the tricky part. And, you know, trying to find the right analysis method to give you the correct answer is often difficult. And there's often a lot of problems with distortion and, and different things, especially in the case of like a shoe where the shoe can flex and then right, the impression yeah. can can bend. And so you have these distortions we have to compare. Um, I mean, and... laser profiling is, is, is something that has been used for that particular application, but it's, it's also been tried out. And I think we referenced a, a paper or a couple of papers uh, in, in, in this where they've used um, 3D uh, laser profilers. But again, it's, it's, it's more about the, the you know, we, we want to, I think one of the things we're, we're quite mindful of uh, uh, Foster and Freeman is developing technologies that not only solve a problem, but actually are able to be implemented within solutions that people are already used to using. Because when you have that natural kind of workflow, to add an extra tool into it is so much easier than having a standalone system that perhaps does, you know, one or two particular things. It's not going to get the use that something like a VSC will. Now, obviously, there's a there's commercial trade-offs that need to be made because you know the more you put into something, obviously, the higher the price of of those of the particular components are, but also the complexity um, goes up significantly. So you know there are always um, trade-offs that that need to be made, but for the most part, that's that's kind of what we're trying to achieve with with all elements of research that we do. But I think. The fact that we are doing the research, we're, we're, we're more than open to engaging with collaborations. Um, I mentioned about the work with University of Kent. We couldn't have done that work because we didn't have an OCT system, but we had the idea to use that particular technology for a particular challenge. So, you know, we enjoy kind of embarking on those kind of voyages. And um, it's, it's really important for us to publish the work that we do because not just for the, you know, for the people that are involved in the work, you know, and ultimately, when you're a researcher, publishing papers, IP, all that sort of stuff, that is, you know, that's kind of the feathers in the caps that you that you like to wear. Um, but it it helps us in terms of, I guess, our credibility. It helps us to support the products and support some of the applications that we, I guess, as a commercial organization, say that that they can actually perform. I and mean, I think that's really important. Um, it's something that, you know. I, I would, uh, yeah, I would say to help people in terms of their business case decisions to in in an environment where validating equipment, validating techniques, validating processes is absolutely front and center. Being able to leverage things like this, bits of research that have been done, can only be a positive step. 
So it oh, kind yeah. of, I guess it, I guess it benefits everyone really. But um, it does. I mean, it, it, it obviously. I, I think this is great because it just embarks in a new area in in document analysis, and uh, it opens the door to other things. And you know, you've talked about future work here, right in the paper, right? So you're talking about. Uh, you know, interference of stroke direction of the crossing intersection. So what, what would you like to see happen there? Like what kind of studies are you thinking about there? Um, loads of things. I mean, we, we've <laughs> got, um, yeah, there, there, there is just so many, I mean, it's different, different pen types, uh, different paper types. Um, when you have, um, different inks as well, then you have different optical properties of those particular inks. So does that change the, the ability of one particular process over the other? Um, we we've also kind of thought about things where you've got um stamps for example like passport stamps when they're above or below different inks then that all comes into uh, comes into the equation but i think one of the one of the key things from this piece of work is you know it's a pilot study it's a proof of concept there are lots of pilot studies and proof of concept uh publications that are out there and one of the things that um i guess is a frustration not just for me but Pretty much everybody that I guess worked in in the research environment is that it's going from that proof of concept to exploitation, and that's the big that's the big jump that needs to happen. So there are some things that we talk about here in the future work, whereby we want to try and do double blind studies. We want to right. try and have a wider range of donors. We want to try it out on um, age samples because naturally, you know, things like that will have a, an effect on the plumpness of the fibers in the in the particular document. So. There's a whole range of things, where, and we are just scratching the surface with this. Um, but you know, it's a, it's an it's an absolutely crucial step in the right direction for us to, I guess, to to really develop things um, further as I guess the market requires it to to do so. Yeah, and uh, I'm curious about because you say that the VSC 8000 is semi quantitative, but you you do get measurements from it. Yep, yep, you can get measurements from it. We can. Um, we can do um, sort of measurements on the X, Y, um, uh, you know, and so we, we can calibrate in, in that respect. We, we have a, um, spe a spectrophotometer in there as well. So we can do um, measurements of uh, absorption and reflectance as well. Um, it's the semi quantification is largely to do with the, with the Z axis in terms of getting that, that depth measurement. And, and uh, that's where we, you know that's why we we use the gel site to kind of confirm yeah not compare oh yeah okay great yeah awesome um yeah i think it's a wonderful area and i i always thought that there was uh definitely some utility in using 3d you know 3d technologies in this particular area but as i as i always said i know i, I usually know where the difficulty is and that is trying to well first off um, trying to find the correct technique and exploring now all these different areas that you mentioned right that's going to take mm. quite a bit of work um you know the blind testing and everything else but now do you do you partner at all with universities and other uh, other institutions like to do research and things like that uh, do people come yeah, to we, you we, sometimes we, we, we try to get involved as, as much as possible we have a we have a phd project on at the minute with a with a uh, university uh, not not too far from from us um and that's loosely related to QDE examination, actually. But we we have relationships with probably you know, another half dozen universities in the UK, um, police forces. We try and engage in some research projects where possible as well. Um, you know, we appreciate and we respect that there needs to be impartiality, and uh, certainly from from the public sector. But and that's one of the reasons why we we like to publish what we do because the whole point of publishing work is that it's transparent. Um, it is impartial it's peer-reviewed um and it's for the benefit of the of the wider community so yeah uh, absolutely we 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 relish the opportunity to to work with with third parties and and kind of harness some of the some of their skills to uh, out, along with ours and and kind of collectively um move things forward um so so yeah i'm more than happy to to hear from anyone that has uh, has any any suggestions uh, just one question here, actually, uh, from Muntawa Kila Madu. Uh, he's asking about product support and maintenance repair. Can you talk briefly on that? And I, th I think he means with, for uh, Foster and Freeman, not for Gelsite. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can do. I mean, we we support our products um, basically as long as long as we can. I mean, we we're, we're like um, like many other manufacturers. We we have a, a product roadmap. We can we can support products that are out in field um, as long as we can get the 
you know the, the parts that are required and what have you but fundamentally um i think one of the things that we're well known for is that that robustness of product um and also our customer support in terms of our product training uh, and our applications training so generally speaking when we when we supply a product we offer training along with that and we will have one of our application specialists who are as the name suggests they are specialists in in that particular product application they will travel out to customer sites and do one-on-one -on -one training group training we've obviously now started doing online training so we can do a hybrid kind of training uh, program as well we're in the process of developing e-learning platforms as well um, which i think is another really really important tool people want to be able to have data information all of that sort of stuff available when they need it rather than on a schedule that suits everyone so having an e-learning platform is really important for us as well so that's there's a huge amount of work that's gone into developing that so um yeah we you know our, our customer support is is very good uh, i would say that but but it is it, it genuinely is and um yeah uh, we we have a distribution network now we we supply products into over 140 countries worldwide and um you know the uk is probably about five to eight percent of what we do um america north america canada it's a huge market for us um and yeah we we have distribution partners we have um our head office is in the uk but we also have a facility in um in virginia in, in the united states they've been there for about 20 years now um, we have a new office in uh, i was saying new it's about three or four years old in germany and we have uh, a more recent uh, office that we opened in, in the Netherlands as well. So we're we're starting to branch out a little bit in terms of our physical presence, but we 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 generally have a distribution network all around the world. Um, if I want to, uh, I'm, I'm just putting up the uh, the website here. But if anyone goes to uh, fosterfreeman.com, you'll see that there's a contact area there. So Roberto, if anyone, I, if somebody wants to get a hold of you or something like that, that's one way, I guess, through the website. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and also, I've got uh, asked you about this before, but uh, Roberto is also on LinkedIn. He's he posts every now and then. In fact, that's how I saw the paper uh, that uh, that you had posted earlier. So uh, you can always reach out to him there as well. Um, Roberto, look, uh, we're getting on in time. I want to say thank you so much. I think it's uh, really exciting research, uh, embarking in these new areas. And I know there's always a lot of work to do. Sometimes it's overwhelming, but hopefully, uh, you know, you get some help from other uh, parties. Yeah, I, I think it's fair yeah. to say we're, ne we're never short of ideas. It's uh, it's getting them, getting them done. <laughs> that's, that's always a challenge. Yeah, for no, sure. It's been great, Eugene. Honestly, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. And uh, thanks for everyone for, uh, for, for dialing in and uh, positive comments I can see coming in in the in the comment section. Yeah, definitely. Great. People from all over the place. We got Romania, we've got Turkey, we've got uh, Argentina, we've got the United States, we got Canada. Well, so we're going, we're going viral, Eugene. <laughs> hey, we're global. We go global here, so it's all good. Hey, listen, do me a favor, hang back, and I'll come um, come chat with you just a bit. No worries, we'll do. All right, cheers. Okay, everyone. Well, that does it for this one. Uh, another uh, successful uh, Forensics Talks. We're going to be back again pretty soon. We're going to do as much as we can this summer. Of course, there's a lot of things going on with people uh, and vacation and stuff. But uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. I want to wish you all the best and have a happy Thursday. Bye-bye.